name is Vahid Chitza. I was part of Elite Mastermind Group. Thank you for being here this morning. I got a lot of questions. I don't know how much time you got, but I want to just jump right into it. Let's you're an go. author. You're a motivational speaker. You're a mm. trainer. You're a coach. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. But my favorite work is Three Feet from Gold. I got your signature over here. And I think, there we go. There we go. That's it. I think I bought one of the ones that had a CD in it. And I actually had it to go get a new laptop, find a used laptop that actually had a CD player so we could play that. That's wow. how, that's how oh, this is like OG. Listen, I don't think people understand how it was back in your time that you had to go do all those interviews with those camcorders and tripods. And I don't think you're like the OG of the OGs because a lot of people do interviews these days mm -hmm. and these cats don't understand how easy they got it. You went through all those challenges. So what can you tell us about those times? Well, first of all, hi, long time no see. Last time was in Orange County, long time ago at the TGR, uh, you know, live event. And it's a pleasure to see you again. And Same I here. remember, again, when we were chatting offline through Instagram on direct messages, it just instantly came to my mind of all the great work you've been doing. So congratulations. You're Thank building you. up your audience, you're kicking ass, and you're making a positive impact. So Thank yes to you. So years ago in 2008, 100 years after Napoleon Hill was given a letter by Andrew Carnegie to go meet all his friends, the Napoleon Hill Foundation and the surviving family gave me a very similar letter. It was kind of like a Willy Wonka ticket to meet whoever I want. And we went around the country and we interviewed the most powerful and successful people. And we wrote the first ever book that we did to the Napoleon Hill Foundation called Think and Grow Rich, Three Feet from Gold. This is the 12th or 13th year anniversary, by the way. You do have the OG school version of that. And the whole idea was there's a dream, there's a challenge, and then victory. Almost everyone quits in the challenging times. And we sat down and went face to face with these amazing people and said, why didn't you quit? How'd you keep going? Even when it got rough. And we put it all into this and it went on to sell in like 45 different languages and inspire many people. But this is the cool thing. I don't know if you know this or not. The last book Napoleon Hill was gonna write before he died was this, and he never got a chance to. It was called Success in Something Greater. And so the Napoleon Hill Foundation granted Sharon Lecter and I the rights to do this and it's now available at all the bookstores worldwide. But how cool is that? That is awesome. That I mean, I got thinking Gorish in like 15 different covers and I got so <laughs> many of them. So it's great. But here's a fun fact that I think a lot of people don't know. And then I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to edit this video and I'm going to put it on my page and I'm going to repost a couple of times because I think everybody should do it. It's Friday morning. Not everybody might be on the live, but I know you told this story out of one of your live sessions that Napoleon Hill wasn't the first person that Andrew Carnegie approached to write the book, Thinking Go Rich. How did that go all about? Because it, he wasn't the first one, but he had to go through a couple of hundred people and a lot of people were not taking that opportunity to write that book and dedicate 20 years of their lives. Yeah, well, when Napoleon Hill started, he was a 23 year old uh, magazine reporter for Su Success Magazine. And what happened is he gained access to the richest guy of the world, Andrew Carnegie at the time. So people that don't understand this, it'd be like putting Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Oprah, Branson, all together at one person. That's how rich this guy was. It was supposed to be a, a 30 minute interview, turned out to be three full days and nights. At the end of the interview, Carnegie says, I've given you all the information I possibly can. You are loaded with all the content. Now here's an opportunity. He said, work for me for free for 20 years and I'll send you on a mission to meet my friends. You'll sit down, create their ever formulas and write the Bible of personal development, think and grow rich. The original title was Oodle for Your Noodle, by the way. And Napoleon Hill thought to himself and said, work for free for what? And he turned to his host and says, not only will I take that task, I promise you I will complete it. And Carnegie says, you got yourself a job. And Hill says, why are they gonna talk to me? I'm just a kid, I'm nobody, I'm not connected. He says, I'll write you a letter of recommendation. When they see it, they'll know I sent you, sent you all the time you want. Sat down with Edison, Einstein, Forbes, the Rockefellers, and wrote the Bible of Personal Development, the 20th best-selling book in history. But here's what people don't know. Carnegie was a stickler for action. 
and gave his guest only 60 seconds to make up his mind to work for free for 20 years after giving him all the information to make that decision. And when Napoleon Hill walked out of the office, Carnegie pulled out a stopwatch he began in his pocket and there was 31 seconds left. He made a monumental life-changing decision in 29 seconds. But what gets really interesting is that Carnegie made that same offer to over 250 men before Napoleon Hill. He was the only person to say yes. Everyone else had something called a bad case of the one size. That means I'm gonna take action once I get the big break, once I get the money or once the perfect timing. And the timing is never right. The single thing that holds most people back from a golden opportunity of life is their big butt. And I don't mean the one you're sitting on. They sit there and say, I'd go do that. And it's that butt that holds them back. I agree with that. So, I mean, how long did it take you to write the three feet from gold? Because you went around doing the same thing. And I think when Napoleon Hill wrote the book, he, the success principles still hold true today. But I think you did it with the higher technology, with more uh, availability. But at the same time, you had to physically go to these people and actually get the interviews, coordinate the time, energy, effort. I mean, all these different things. And I don't think you got paid for doing the interviews with them. You went and did it. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. When I did my project, Napoleon Hill Foundation thought it'd be very appropriate to pay me the same wage that Napoleon Hill got. I got nothing. And so I went on this journey and I literally, I, I, I short sold my house. I, I, I hawked my Rolex watch. I voluntarily repossessed my two Mercedes Benz. I went all in and said, look, I can always get my stuff back, but will I ever have this opportunity? And so for three years, I ran around the world just interviewing all these amazing people. And I thought, what a great golden you know, chance to learn from these people. That's what's missing in today's society. All these Instagram BS wannabe guru guys, you know, they don't have credibility. They're not a credible source. And I said, what if I just went to the actual person that everyone else is talking and telling stories about? So I figured, man, if I could go and talk to the guy who started NASCAR, a billion dollar brand or Ugg Boots or Make-A-Wish Foundation or created super strength theory, then my brain would be expanded the same way because I'm learning right from the people who did it. I agree. So what is the definition of a stickability in your opinion? Well, stickability, great thing. It's a little plug here. Stickability has to be parallel with another word called flexibility. If you're not willing to adapt and adjust, you'll get stuck. And I learned a story about a spider monkey from the founder of the uh, cell phone, Marty Cooper. And he says that, you know, in the rainforest, a spider monkey is the most quick, nimble creature. You can't harpoon it, spear it, catch it. It's too wiry. But one hunter figured it out. He took a heavy log, drilled a tiny hole, dropped a peanut inside, and left it at the base of the jungle. The monkey would smell the nut come down from the treetop, reach his hand in, grab a hold of the nut, and his fist becomes so big he can't pull it back out and become anchored to the log. All he's gotta do is let go, but he thinks that nut is nutrition, it's saving. So he holds on with dear life. The hunter comes by an hour later, captures the elusive spider monkey. And the message is, are we holding on to our own nut right now? It could be in the form of a job or a deal or a guilt or remorse. And what we think is saving us just like the monkey thought the nut was, could also be the thing that's leading to our own demise. Sometimes we have to have the courage and fortitude to simply let go so we can adapt and adjust to live to fight another day. And I see some comments are popping up. Hi, everybody. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of questions in there, but I got more. I got more. So you interviewed all these people. You had the fortunate to, to, to go around and do all these different things. What were the one or two things that you think was common among most of them. I know success principles were, were, were obviously all of I mean, they had to utilize let, those. Let me, let, me, let me answer that. And so what's interesting is something called CPC. They understood the power of this. Clues, patterns, choices. And it works like this. It's about accountability and responsibility for every single thing that happens. Stop blaming other people. So CPC, it's clues, patterns, choices, works like this. If I go out on a first date, I'm a single guy, and the woman's 20 minutes late, that's a flag or a clue. If I go on the second, third, and fourth date, she's 20 minutes late, that's a pattern. Now, it's my choice whether I deal with it, adjust it, yell at her, break up, but it's not her fault. She's just late. Stop trying to change people. How many times have we seen in business someone with a bad reputation, then they'll cheat your friend, 
you do business because it'll be different. You get cheated and you're mad at that person. It's not fair. It's about accountability and responsibility. You made that choice. It's like seeing a rattlesnake rattle, bite your kid's sister. You go to pet it, get bit, and you're mad at the snake. Suck it up. Start having accountability and responsibility what happens. I see so many fake gurus out there these days that, you know, I was talking to one of my friends. I'm not like, I, I, I actually told him, I said, I'm going to interview the OG of all the interview. Like, I'm going to interview him. He goes, what do you mean? I was like, these guys don't know. They have never been punched in the face. They didn't have to. The, the worst that happened to them, their comments on their Instagram got deleted or they couldn't send a DM. You actually had to go travel for three years and deal with all those different obstacles to get all these information. Okay, okay. Out. But again, let's have some responsibility. In my industry, which is, you know, it's got challenges itself. And I'm talking smack about my own industry. We're the ones that are the byproduct of that because all these you know, motivational people kept telling people, fake it till you make it. Now we can't bitch about them because they're faking it till they make it. We're the ones who told them to do it. So again, it's about accountability and responsibility that's happening. Now, the other thing is, don't be afraid to ask someone to prove their expertise before you follow them. I'll give an example. If someone comes up and says, look, I want to, uh, you know, help you do a best-selling book. Say, great, let's go to Barnes & Noble right now. Show me all your books on the shelf. If they can't do it, stop listening to them. If someone says, hey, I want to teach you how to be a speaker, so awesome, show me your video reel if you talk at United Nations or at the Pentagon or something. If they can't do that, stop listening to them. The bottom line is it's up to us to start seeking this counsel and you know people that are reputable, but it ultimately, again, it falls onto us. I agree with that. What's your favorite book? You know, that's like picking your favorite child. But I'll tell you, my favorite book of all time, Jim Stovall, The Ultimate Gift. I just absolutely love that book. Ultimate Gift. How how important was, so based on your, your, your affiliation with all of these gurus, and most of them have read the book, Thinking Go Rich, just an estimation, how many times would you say you have read the book, Thinking Go Rich? I, I couldn't put a number on it because I, I, I beginning to end, Zero through the whole book, thousand. I don't know because it's my study program, right? So, you know, I, it's not like one of those things you sit down and you just read from the beginning because it's like a storyline. It every single time you see something and you stop and go back. So, the first chapter I was reading three feet from gold, or then I got, got, got all excited. Well, we're three feet from gold, so we did that book. And then, all of a sudden, we were reading Success and Something Greater, so we did that book. And then I kept reading, and they talked about stickability, and I did that book. And then I saw thoughts or things, and then I did that book. And then I did so the whole thing is that, you know, we're observers of it, but more importantly, we're applying the wisdom. See, here's the biggest challenge. A lot of people are out there thinking and want to grow rich, but they're actually not doing and growing rich. And that's one of the biggest challenges in today's marketplace, no matter what it is, because thoughts are worthless. It's the action behind the attraction that makes your dreams come true. Think it, feel it, get off your backside, take action, and you got to do it. I believe that. I mean, a lot of people need to definitely take action. And, and that's, I mean, when I read the book, Three Feet, when I read the book, Thinking Go Rich, I got to the story, Three Feet from Gold. I was stuck on that story for two years. I, and I said, as long as I don't give up, and this is like 14 years ago, I was like, as long as I don't give up on what I'm doing, mm -hmm. I'm going to make it. So for the first two years, I can't say I read the book. I read it up to three feet from gold, and that got me through two years. So I was like, if two pages of the book could get me going for two years, imagine if I read the whole thing, what could happen? <laughs> and yeah, that was and, a scary and, thought. And, I was like, then, Whoa. And, yeah, and then there's different versions. So like this is the original 1937 version. And the reason why that's important to even state is because what happened was people go, oh, there's missing stuff. No, Napoleon Hill, when, when they're writing the paperback, Hill had to go through and edit things that he could leave out so they can make it thinner to fit in your back pocket. In fact, I don't know if my phone will go with me, but I'm going to try to show you something that I don't think anyone's ever seen. So this will be a drum roll, please. I have no idea if my phone will come up here, but if so, you're going to kind of like this because it, it's, it's pretty special. So Napoleon Hill, when he was doing this, pro oh, by the way, check this out. When Napoleon Hill was going around the country 
he actually had to write checks to himself to reimburse him for the travel. This is one of the only checks that was actually signed and notarized by Napoleon Hill for his travel throughout, you know, his, nice. his team. You're putting that for, uh, for auction? You know, I do have one for auctions. Yeah, the truth is, yes. And, and by the way, so check this one out. Uh, wait, 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 wait. I'm trying to find something cool. I came up here specifically for something. This is a library, by the way. Yes, take that a is look. nice. See all the different stuff. But there is something here. If I can, yep, check this out. This is the actual book that Napoleon Hill used to mark it up. You see all those writing? Yeah. So that's what he did. So that was the original Think and Grow Rich. And then he would write notes and cross stuff out and say, this is what he'll use to write the actual paperback that everyone reads today. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I seriously think because I've seen so many book shelves that I have been to people's homes mm -hmm. and they bought the book and the book is literally sitting there and you could see the cover is like faded because it's been in sun and they haven't cracked it open. So there are like so many people that buy the book. They know it works. But just like you said, the action is definitely missing of actually utilizing it. But if I can get oh, you wait, to wait, give wait, us a little wait. bit I of... Saw, I haven't showed you the cool thing. Stop. Check this out. I'm listening. Go this ahead. Go. I'm, I'm actual, watching. This is, the this is the typewriter he wrote Law of Success and Think and Grow Rich on. Nice. That's the actual uh, uh, the thing. So you're talking about... The reason I show you that is because we talk about modern times and go, oh, we didn't have the internet and Zooms and all that different stuff. Well, the thing about Napoleon Hill, all they had was, you know, old airline tickets and things of this nature. He, he, and, and, and a typewriter that he would sit there and peck at. And that's how he wrote that amazing classic. So sometimes you just got to make do with what you got. All right, go ahead. Next question. So my question is, if somebody is starting to read The Thinking Grow Rich, mm -hmm. I know a lot of people are, are eager to go through the book and everything else. What is your suggestion for studying a book in the correct manner? What is your recommendation as a coach? How should they go through this? You know, everyone's got a different thing. I'm going to just give you mine. You know, I, I open it up to certain areas and I just go here. And this is what I go with. Just like you went to three pages. Same thing for me. I, I kept getting stuck too. That's why I kept writing all these Think You Grow Rich books through the foundation because I go to a certain thing and go, man, that's brilliant. And then I go back and forth. But my favorite one chapter is the biggest chapter of Think and Grow Rich that no one talks about. The Six Ghosts of Fear. And Napoleon Hill, you know, would always talk about what he thought were the biggest fears. And I disagree. I'm going to be quite frank with you. And the Napoleon Hill Foundation, the family and I talk about this quite a bit. Because 100 years ago, the fear of old age was a legitimate fear because you would die at an early age. Or the fear of loss of love or what have you, or the fear of loss. And I think that we modernize them. In one of these books, I don't remember which one, I modernized the fears and I said, the biggest three fears that people have is the fear of the unknown, it's the fear of pain, and the biggest one is judgment, is criticism, what other people are thinking. And there's a coffee mug at Disneyland that says, what would you do if you couldn't fail? And the big question is, what would you do when you stop worrying about what other people thought? You know, would you write that book? Would you make a movie? Would you ask that girl out for a date? And I realized the biggest thing that the most successful people do is they, they have fear, but they go towards it and they don't run away. That is, I mean, that's an amazing tip. And, and a lot of people get confused when they read all the chapters and I tell them not to read more than one chapter, at least a week. Like they got to work on it. They got to meditate on it. They got to internalize it and then go do it. Which yeah, is and, the this, and this one right here is the old J. So when I started working at Point Hill Foundation, they went in the back of me. Don Green pulled this off the uh, shelves. This is one of the last ones Hill signed ever before he died. Wow. Isn't that crazy? That's not going in auction, is it? No, it is not. But I do I do have, honestly, a, one of those signed checks. There are very few in the entire world. And uh, the foundation sent it to me because I was supposed to auction at uh, my last Secret Knock event. So I'm going to do it in September unless you put in a bid, but that's, that's going to go for auction. Awesome, awesome. What's your favorite part from Three Feet from Gold? Because I'm going to tell her, I'm going to take a couple of screenshots of the pages of these that are like my favorite, and I'm going to put it on my page. And I know a thousand people, I mean, <laughs> it's so funny. Uh, 
you know Jeffrey Gittimore, so I had it. I had one of his books, um, and I just out of fun, I was just reading one of the books, and I took a picture of it and I put it in there. Believe it or not, in one day, I got over a thousand direct messages of what that book was about, and I just sent everybody to the Amazon link. I was like, I just go here and get it. That's it. So I'm gonna. I'm. I haven't done it because I'm scared. Because I get a thousand DMs and I don't know how to reply to people. I literally got to sit there and just copy and paste. And it just takes so much. So I am afraid of putting this up because I know it's going to do, if not as good as that, because I know some, I took a lot of tips out of this. This was very dear to my so heart. Three, three Feet from Gold is a great book. And, and, and the greatest takeaway for me out of that book was the guy who created Super Strength Theory. And he taught me a lesson that's in there. It says, successful people seek counsel where failures listen to opinion. And I said, what's the difference? He goes, opinions based on ignorance, lack of knowledge, and experience, like all your family friends who've never done what you want to do. Counsel is based on wisdom, knowledge, mentorship, people who paved the way. If you go to a family friend and say you're going to write a best-selling book, they might talk you out of it to protect you, and they've never written a best-selling book. If you go to Jack Canfield, who wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul, He's going to just say, sit down before you get started. Here's what you need to know and give you counsel. If we would spend our activity only seeking counsel and ignoring people's opinion, that's the day your life would change. Three feet from gold. The junk men went to RU Darby and bought the merchant. I think we need to do it. I, I don't know. We got to do a video on that because that junkman was working on that talk and how he wanted to be in gold mine business for many, many, many years. They just think a lot of people read the story and they just think that, oh, he just came around. It was a gold mine for sale, you know, and then here's 200 bucks. Let me buy it. But they don't know that that guy was planning on that and the opportunity presented itself at that time. And right. then that's what happened. And, so, he sought, and he sought counsel. Because where Darby gave up on the mine because he had no idea about the industry, the junk man went to an engineer and says, what happened? This guy hit gold and ran out. And the engineer starts laughing. He says, that's mining 101. Everyone knows gold runs in a straight line. It's called the gold vein. Darby came in one side, hit the gold, and popped back into dirt. He said, go back to where they discovered treasure. Go three feet, you'll tap back into the vein. Not only did the junk man end up pulling millions of dollars out, but that still fills Fort Knox today. I, I, I mean, that to me is like, listen, you should definitely always. So how important is it for individuals to get the right mentor and coach? I know you talked about it. I know credibility is important. I, I think they need to see what they've already done in the past. But let's say I'm a coach and I don't have the glamorous that a lot of other coaches are, but I do provide good mentorship. I mean, I, I know my stuff. How do I go about doing that? Because I feel like a lot of coaches are, are in that limbo where they have the content, but they haven't got the status yet. So they're like, okay, how, you know, how do I go about doing that? Okay, you asked me three different questions right there. So I'm gonna answer them in order. First of all, everyone should have a mentor in their life, but here's the powerful thing. You need multiple mentors in your life. The whole mentor thing is a, is a fallacy. You need many. So I got a great tennis mentor who teaches me my backhand but I'm not gonna ask him for my financial counsel. And I'm not gonna ask my accountant about my public speaking. I'm not gonna ask the speaker guy about my writing. So I seek the very best people that are getting the results I want for myself. And I have those people on my board of directors of my own personal life. And those are the people that guide me. That answers that question. But the other one is how do you get started when you don't have that repertoire? You be honest, be authentic. That's what's missing. You don't rent a you know, it's a, a, an airplane and take in front of a picture of it and pretend it's your airplane. You don't just lean in front of a Lamborghini and take a picture and say it's your Lamborghini. That's what you do. You sit there and be a student. You become a person of transparency and say, look, I'm going through this process right now as a student. I'm just two steps ahead of you. So why don't you come with me and I'm going to teach you everything as I'm going along this quest? Because that is acceptable. And not only that, what would you rather have? A roadmap or a guide? A roadmap, unless you know how to read an exact thing, you can get lost. But a guide is someone's already gone a few steps ahead of you and they know what's coming. So don't be afraid to step into your authentic self and let people know that. But more importantly, they're on the front line that they get to learn everything you are at real time.
Tell us about the programs and how people can reach you and what kind of a mentorship you have available for individuals because I know once I post this video, <laughs> they're going to keep asking me and I don't want to give them the wrong. Where do we send people? How do they get a hold of you? And what are the available programs that you have for for for, for in, individuals to get this close approximate? I know you're in San Diego, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, exactly. Well, I do my big event once a year. It's called Secret Knock. Everyone knows it. it's it's so funny. I started an event where people said, how do I meet all these people you're meeting? So in my living room, I put 12 people in and then it grew and grew. And now we're Forbes Inc. and Entrepreneur's top event in the world for business leaders. And it's the only event you can't go to unless you're invited. So you have to go to secretknock.co and you have to put in an application, make sure you make a good fit to go. But to reach me just right here on Instagram, go to DM me and say, hey, you know, I'm working on this, but here's what is important. I don't like to talk about the weather. I don't want my brain picked. I don't want to talk about what you ate for dinner. But if you have a specific question, say, hey, what could I do differently? What book do you recommend? Where are you at right now? I'd be glad to share that. Can I give you a couple, like, two tips that will change people's lives? For sure. Go right in. This is all people you. ask me all the time, how did I get all these interviews? And the truth of the matter is specificity. And that's what's missing in today. When I went to meet with the guy who started NASCAR, I did not say, I want to pick your brain, take you to dinner, buy you lunch. They don't know me. And I don't like when people do it to me. But it's specificity, here's how you open the door. I would call that person up and say, hey, I'm in San Diego, California. I'm going to fly all the way to Florida. I need 12.5 minutes of your time. From the second the door opens till the time I leave will be 12.5 minutes. I will start a clock. And if I'm not done, you can kick me out. I'm going to ask you only one question. Why you didn't quit through your challenging times? Now, what's the chance of that person giving me 12.5 minutes? Pretty much 100% because it's specific. And that's what's missing in today's world. Everyone says the nicest things, but they don't understand that they're making us work. Here's another example. If I get up on stage and there's 10,000 people, and that's awesome. My chair just cracked, by the way. And all of a sudden, a 1,000 people come up and say, hey, I want to work with you. Uh, how can I be of service? How can I be of contribution? Well, that's awesome. But think about it. I don't know who you are, and I don't want to do a whole resume. But if I walk off stage and go, man, I checked your Instagram. You got a half a million followers. I like your memes. Let me make you one quick one. I'll send it to your cell phone if you like it. Maybe you can use me. Done. Now I know who you are, what you do, and you got my cell phone in literally 15 seconds. The more that we can be specific like that, we'll open up the doors of opportunity that will blow your mind. I agree with that. I hate it when people send me a DM and they say hi. I don't know what to do with that. I mean, I'm not like, what the fuck? Like, you think I'm sitting around over here just saying hi to you? Like, come on, think about it. Like, we got a million other things going on. And you're saying hi. Like, I don't know. Are you saying hi because you're pissed off? Are you saying hi because you're nice? Are you saying hi because you're bored? Uh, is this a business transaction? Is this a business question? Is this like, I don't know. What are you doing when you say hi? Mm -hmm. I don't get it. So, with I, me, I I'm get like, it. So, so, specificity <laughs> is the key. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I was doing this new book. It's called. Wealth Made Easy. I interviewed uh, millionaires and billionaires, people worth $100 million to $1 billion. And I kept asking them these crazy questions. And I realized there's one common denominator that all these billionaires said, be careful what you ask for because you might just get it. And I go, what the hell does that really mean? It's such a bumper sticker bullshit cliche. And he says, no, it works like this. And he said, what if God in the universe granted every wish and every prayer, but we didn't like the packaging, so we sent it on its way? I go, what do you mean? He says, well, you sit there and say, God, I need a hundred bucks. Anything I'll do, anything for a hundred dollars. And the guy pulls up with a pickup truck. It's full of aluminum cans. And he says, hey, I'm running late for a meeting. Take these off my hands, cash them in, they're worth a hundred bucks. Go, I don't want those stinky things. Well, you asked and you prayed, but you didn't like the packaging, so you sent it on its direction. Well, what does that tell your God or the universe the next time you ask for something? So the most successful people understand when they throw it out to the universe, they shut the hell up and they get out of the way and they're not so attached to how it's going to come to them. I agree with that a hundred percent. And and a lot of times it comes in a form of work. Ah, exactly. <laughs> and, and that's why they're not expecting it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Back to the attraction. You know, it's the action, the law of drive. It's so funny when Bob Proctor and I did a book called think and grow rich thoughts are things. We interviewed Holocaust survivors and the founders of billion dollar empires to find out how thoughts become things. And here was our discovery. Thoughts are not things. It's thoughts backed by action become things. So we sat down with these neuroscientists at Harvard and they said, look, 
We've studied the brain. There, we have 64,000 thoughts a day. Unfortunately, majority of them are ants, automatic negative thoughts. They're the reptilian part of your brain to protect you, to keep you safe. He said, so if thoughts were things and most of them are negative, then everything would be drama and chaos in our life. It's not that way. It's only the thoughts that you take action on that become your truth. If thoughts were things, I'd probably be a slice of pizza right now because it's one o'clock and I'm hungry, right? So when we're done with this, if I call Grubhub and they bring me a slice of pizza, will my thoughts become reality by the actions in which we take? If somebody's out there and they're going through challenging times right now, and I believe it is challenging times for a lot of individuals that were not prepared, that a lot of us did not see this coming, but they weren't prepared from before for any type of a disaster or any type of turbulences. Um, what are some of your suggestions for people right now? Because this thing is going to change. It's going to change a lot of things for, for, for foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. What are some of your, your recommendations during these times? Well, again, those are like three or four different things that I could go down rabbit holes. One, first of all, don't over pivot. So I, I, I'll be very clear on this one. Everyone says, oh, it's the new normal. That is complete bullshit. Don't buy into that. Because trust me, we have a short attention span as human beings. The second this thing releases, call it a month, six months, a year from now, whatever that period of time, everything's going to go right back to normal. And so if you take your whole business and bring it online and you do these things to over pivot, then you have to re-unwind that thing to go back to your reality. So be careful that you don't over pivot. That's number one. Door number two, you're not alone. Start a mastermind group. Look, again, there was a bumper sticker. What would you do if you couldn't fail? The big question is, what would you do if you stopped worrying what people think? No one's thinking about you right now. They're dealing with their own situation. So if you ever had that idea for a job or a, you know, starting a new business or writing a book, this is that perfect time. Napoleon Hill always talked about collaboration over competition. This is the time to start thinking that way. Look, if you got an idea for a cool logo and you know another guy makes t-shirts and another guy makes websites, you don't need any money. Start a clothing line, put yourself together, you three collaborate, equal partners, and as soon as this lifts, guess what? You got a brand new business. That's how people should be thinking right now. And I'll give you one more example. This is how we're doing it right now in our industry, is that you know we're seeing all these opportunities that will open when they start opening. Let's say you're in a strip mall and you owned a pizza shop because I'm hungry for that pizza. And there's a liquor store in the corner in that same parking lot and you hate those guys. They always take up all the parking spaces. It's loud, the noise, all the different stuff. You don't like these guys. What if you change that attitude? What if when all this thing opened up, you went next door and you shook hands and said, hey, Bob, you know, every time someone comes to this liquor store, tell you what, here's a bunch of gift certificates for 50% off their next pizza. Why don't you give it to them with that, with that six pack? And then I'll tell you what I'll do is every time I deliver a pizza, I'll give one of your coupons for 50% off a six pack. All of a sudden, that competitor now becomes an ally. And if we start thinking like that, I'm telling you, the world's going to change. Here's what people aren't seeing. Yes, it's horrible, the deaths and the destruction, the things that are happening right now. You know what also is different? More lives are going to be saved than you can possibly understand. And I'm going to tell you the reason why. For the first time in collaboration, the Chinese scientists and doctors are talking to the same people in Russia. And those Russia are talking to Ethiopia. And they're talking to China. And they're talking to Canada. It's never happened. And do you realize that some guy's got a molecular structure of some peptide in a foreign country that someone else is looking for that might be the cure to AIDS or to cancer or something like that? So the discoveries of this collaboration that will come from this will absolutely change human history. Uh, just the speed that FDA is going through all of you. I mean, there's a lot of politics. I'm not going to get into that. But the speed that they're going through this. There's like last report I heard was like seven, eight people, seven, eight companies that are running for that. I mean, it's crazy how fast they're doing. But you know, one thing that I'm not happy with that I hold myself personally responsible is that I wasn't personally prepared if this thing would have happened and I wouldn't have had a notice. My house wasn't prepared. My family wasn't prepared. My supplies weren't prepared. I wasn't prepared for medical needed that needed me i wasn't prepared for the flashlights that i needed like i think i was prepared more than other people but i hold myself to a higher standard i should have been prepared it's government is not going to save me i need to do what i need to do for my family so i'm, that's, I'm that's changing great. the thing and let's first of all congratulations for the accountability and responsibility Thanks. and and so for myself i was over prepared so it's like one of those weird things i mean as soon as things started happening we you know i was already stocked up from you know 
I'm one of those prepper guys, so I was always set. But more importantly, how you can do things in the future will change. So for example, be kind to your future self. What does that mean? If you want to have a cool beach body for summer when the things open up again, put the friggin' cheeseburger and haagen down today. And if you want a you know, shoebox full of money for Christmas to buy presents, put 20 bucks in a shoebox today and then do the same thing tomorrow and then maybe next week. And guess what? If you consistently do that come Christmas, you'll have a shoebox full of money. What can we do today to have a brighter tomorrow? Be kind to your future self. I agree with that 100%. Um, so I, I was going to say how can they find you because I know your event is once a year. So they need to fill out an application and be approved and then you'll let them know when they can show up and all that. Yeah, this is the craziest event. It costs three grand to go and we will not tell you where it is or who will be there, period, the end. And, and, and that's just the way we do it. And we sold out and we're standing room only for what, 13 years in a row. And I got to tell you, it's the, we call ourselves the greatest event you can't go to because what happens is we weed out all the whacker doodles. What does that mean? If you got a tinfoil hat and talk to dead aliens through your cat, I love you, but you're not gonna come to my event. And the reason is, is I bring in these world thought leaders. So last time, I mean, Presidente Vicente Fox came to my event and he didn't wanna bring secret service. So I made sure that we didn't have people that could be a nuisance. When we have a private Skype with Edward Snowden while he's hiding in Russia, or I fly in Tonino Lamborghini from Italy or the founder of Showtime, I wanna make sure that you have access to these people but we're also putting our best foot forward. What's the difference between thinking go rich, PMA, and law of success? You know, it's interesting. A lot of people don't know this, but there was always a debate between Napoleon Hill and W. Clement Stone. And W. Clement Stone said the number one rule of personal success is PMA, positive mental attitude. And Napoleon Hill said it's definite major purpose. And as we know, Napoleon Hill won his side, but then you know, Mr. Stone put out his book for PMA. And it's really interesting because I'm actually towards Stone's direction on this. And I'll tell you the reason why. Because even if you don't know your definite major, major purpose, but you're on direction where you think you're on path, but you're a cool kick-ass person and people like you, then the doors of opportunity start opening where opportunities start unfolding themselves. So I can see the, the combo on that one, but bottom line, PMA is powerful and nowhere, does it say in positive mental attitude that you can't be a realist? Nowhere does it say you have to run from reality, but it also means you don't have to whine, complain, bitch, and moan about it. What you do is you go at it with an open mind and surround yourself with positive people that can see your way through. Yeah, but great. Goddamn law of success is 1,100 pages. <laughs> yeah, well, just open it somewhere and, 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 like a, and, and touch it and, and go from there. And again, I mean, I, wait, 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 I showed you I showed you the uh, typewriter. He typed that thing on, man. So imagine that. He's sitting there going like this, typing on that thing the whole time. I mean, this is funny. My, my wife was making fun of me. She's like, are you highlighting the whole book? Because like half of the page is like highlighted. Each I'm all like, this is important. I need to highlight. Then I realized I'm highlighting the whole page. So I was like, just let go of the highlighter because I'm going to highlight the whole thing. This I actually ordered seven different laws of success, seven different books to find one that could fit in my bag that I could kind of go back and forth. This with a small text is, I don't want to give you the wrong page. This is almost 400 pages. With the other version that I got, the small text is about like six, 700 pages. Yeah. But the true one, the big one, like 1,100 pages with the spaces and codes. Right, right, right. So here, here's the deal. If you go on to, I don't really remember where it's at, but it's somewhere on YouTube. When I went to the Napoleon Hill Foundation, I was hanging out with Napoleon Hill's grandson, and I got to actually pull out and hold the original manuscript. And it was this thick. <laughs> it was crazy because, again, it was hand-typed the whole bit. I got to get going. I just want to say thanks for having me on. I appreciate you greatly. Yeah, recommend Definitely. three feet from gold. I invite you to DM me. And if there's anything I can do to be of contribution, just have clarity and let me know. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Stay safe. Bye. Bye.